I have entered into the service of a new gentleman. It would seem... He is a gambling man, hey! My name's Dr. Knot. London, 1872. Mmm, gorgeous here. Alright, this is 80 Days, Season 2. We had a request, we're fulfilling the request, and this time... We're gonna go around the world and do a different route, so if you want to see what happened on the first time, check out the previous season. This time though, look at this, you can actually see the route we took the first time. So you can see we went through, let's see, London, Northern Europe, basically the Trans-Siberian uh, train or that is, down through around the Korea Peninsula, through Japan, tried going across straight to San Francisco, but we had to go down to Hawaii, get to San Francisco Bay, go across, down the Mississippi, up the East Coast, and basically a la Titanic if it went the other way and didn't sink, and back to London with some time to spare. This time though, I'm gonna try something a little different. We're gonna start in London and I wanna go straight south. We're gonna straight, straight south it through Africa and see if, how long we can stay in the Southern Hemisphere. That's the goal this time. I'm going to try doing about 13 days per episode, so however long those end up being, that's how long we're going to do. We're going to explore a little more, too, this time, so we're going to try finding new things. Let's begin in London. Day 1, we have 4,000 pounds. Tuesday, 7 p.m., my master returned home from the Reform Club with a strange gleam in his eye. Pass Pateau, he said. We are going around the world. Pack my hunting rifle and my evening jacket. There's not a moment to waste. You, Pass Pateau. Pass Part 2, I believe. Now have funds. Oh, good. All right, new routes discovered. Down to Paris. That's about it. So let's pack our stuff. Whoa. Shall we? We might go on a safari. Uh, I'm gonna avoid Europe. We're gonna take the evening jacket. Part of the Englishman's wardrobe set. We have it complete here. Boom. There's our Englishman's wardrobe. We're not gonna take the European train table because we're going straight down to Africa. Let's go. All right, we can take one bag. We have one bag. It doesn't hurt us in the uh, the old health department, which is down here in the bottom right. Amphitrite Express to Paris, departing now. The guard's van has space for one suitcase, which will suffice. All right, it's a bearable route. Let's go. The Amphitrite Express. We left aboard the 825 from Charing Cross as the final whistle shrieked its warning. Our journey had begun. I'm on fine form, but we must make haste. I'm probably not going to converse too much, because we didn't really gain a whole lot. At least not with, uh, not with our, you know, our master, we'll, we'll, Monsieur Fogg, we'll, we'll talk to other people along the way. The Amphitrite Express rattled along narrow gauge rails to Dover its fins extended and it plunged directly into the channel. Monsieur Fogg made no remark as the dark water pressed against our windows. I thought it was so marvelous at the time. How many marvels how many marvels were still to come? Oh, many, because we're not sticking to the Northern Europe route. Maybe we'll go to Nice. We splashed up onto the rails at Calais and closed the remaining miles to Paris Square de Nou quickly. Oh yeah, once again I have to mention, I cannot speak other languages, and I really am bad at my pronunciation, so please bear with me. According to today's paper, Monsieur Fogg remarked, the Orient Express now runs as far as Bucharest. I don't care, we're not taking that route. Alright, so we've got the Paris to Munich, to Vienna, to Budapest, to Bucharest, but we're not doing that. Maybe we'll go to Nice. Okay, so we can sell the 45 caliber rifle here. I don't really think we need to do that. What are we looking at? What can we sell it for? Sell for 580? Or 590? Eh. The driving cab, we've got the... That's worth in Copenhagen, I'm not, I'm not... We're not going that way. Of interest to poor, earnest, and prim types. So we can get more info out of people. But I don't want to do that for a whole other suitcase. I think we're fine. Let's explore. We should explore. This is the whole point of uh, what we're doing around here. New routes discovered. Amsterdam and Nice. Oh, that's the one we're taking. The exposition universelle sprawled over the grounds of the purpose-built Le du Champ de Mont. Hot air balloons sailed gently across the sky, and the powdery light of the Yob Club 
Yablokov, Yablokov candles gleamed invitingly. Hmm. Memories of the siege were too painful, and I stayed locked up in my room. No! I can't do that. I suppressed my memories of the siege and visited the exposition. That's more like it. We need to explore. I headed... Oh, what are we going to do? We did the Artificer's Guild the last one, I think. Maybe we did... I can't remember what we did. Let's... Uh, I took a stroll down the Avenue of Nations. Lined with buildings in the styles of the nations of the world, and men by foreign delegates in national dress. A most eclectic sight. Oh yeah, Zulu Federation had built a replica village, and brought a delegation of 400 diplomats and warriors, which... made for a busy, impressive stand. Above the display was a fine pharaoh type of their great emperor, Ketshweo, in his palace in Ulundi. One of the young Impi warriors dropped his fierce look and winked brightly at a passing child who erupted into shy giggles. One of his fellow soldiers caught me looking and tilted his spear in my direction with a glare. I turned away hurried, hurriedly. Avenues sprawled in every direction between the inviting illuminated pavilions of the exposition. Mm. I went west towards the airship hangar past a booth with a husband and wife pair selling panoramic hot air balloon rides to eager tourists. Yeah, let's check this out. We didn't take the hot air balloons last time. I inquired as to their hourly rate, wondering if perhaps the balloon could be encouraged to go a little way east as well and, and contribute to our great journey. 80 pounds for a half hour flight, the man responded. I gaped. That is robbery, the man shrugged. We are the only balloonists here today. Are you willing to miss out on the experience of a flight over Paris? I'm going around the world, I replied. I hope for much more impressive sights in the days to come. The man nodded and moved on to the next punter with great swiftness. I regarded the airships that filled the hangar behind him. There were a huge number on display from all over the world, and my eye was immediately caught by, oh yeah, the African-made rigid metal balloon of hammered copper and tin called the Shaba Meli. You are lucky, friend, the smiling Tutsi mechanic waved at me with a spanner still in his inner fist. This is the first Shaba Meli to be seen in Europe. She tucked her spanner back into her belt and added sadly, what terrible weather you suffer here. It is not even properly winter yet, I retorted, a little stung. I'd always thought October to be a most pleasant, delightful, a, mo a most delightful and pleasant time to experience Paris. It gets worse, she shivered, and tucked her hands to her pockets. You poor creatures. I raised my eyebrows. How fast does the Shabameli go? I asked. Faster than a Gaic, but a bit slower than the new Persian Bayandors, she replied promptly. You can take Shabameli from Khartoum all the way south to the Cape. Oh, that sounds good. Perhaps one day soon, Monsieur Fogg and I would find ourselves flying in such a craft? I returned to the exposition center, my thoughts turning with clouds and engine rotors. Crowds of tourists jostled and heaved past, their eyes wide with wonder. Yeah, let's take... We're going south, that's for sure. So we have to get to Khartoum. Then we can go all the way down to South Africa. I like that. I decided to take my leave, and I returned to Monsieur Fogg, who was eating a meal of plain boiled beef à la glaise. <laughs> Did you enjoy the exposition? My master inquired. Diffidently. Having preferred a hearty meal in an English newspaper to all the wonders that the modern world had to offer. We are unspeakably lucky to live in such an age of invention. I declared. It will certainly make it easier to win my wager, Monsieur Fogg replied mildly. Wager? I demanded. Indeed, I have a staked I have staked I have us staked. A large sum that we will na circumnavigate the globe in 80 days or less. Remarkable! Oh yeah, see, we have to go down to Khartoum. And we'll go all the way... Oh wait, that's not the cape? What the hell? Alright, what are we looking at in terms of departing? When is Nice... Parts in two days? Let's negotiate. They allow for five bags, too. The Englishman's wardrobe should deal the results. Oh, yeah. Let's take that. 
That's fantastic. 9 a.m.? Okay, so... Ah, where'd I go? Parts tomorrow at 9 a.m. So we can stay in the hotel, right? Gets us to 6.30 a.m. We took a hotel for the night. We'll be comfortable here, Monsieur Fogg remarked, but traveling overnight will often be more efficient. Where possible. We cannot travel where it is not possible, certainly, he replied. Still, the surrounds of the Hotel Ritz were most enjoyable. Alright, great. Now... We're going to Nice. Pyrenees Express. Sweet. We boarded our train at Gare de Lyon, which had opened only the previous week. The ticket booths were all staffed by automata, and cylinder phonographs installed throughout the station played La Marseillaise in triumph. We found a compartment and settled into plush seats with a complimentary glass of Provenca. <laughs> oh my god. Rose. Rosé to grace the trip. We French, we know how to travel, I declared. Is it too much to hope the rest of our journey will be so comfortable? Yes, said Monsieur Fogg shortly, before taking a single parsimonious sip of his wine. What's on the news? Julius Fogg attempts round the world adventure. How do they know already in the Times? Not even over France yet. The hours flew by and I spent them in conversation, trying to gather information for our next leg. I met a charming French master, whom I quickly abandoned as knowing nothing. Okay. The train rattled on, arriving to Nice later in the evening. We stepped out to balmy autumn weather and a gentle murmur in the air. Ah, my friends, the sea. All right, we're now dependable. You seem quite a handy man to have around, Passport 2. All right, nothing's open. It's 9 o'clock, so we're going to stay the night here. The long pebbled beaches of Nice were filled with Italians of one sort or another. A few protesting the loss of the city to France and quoting Garibaldi with a great passion. I ignored them and took to the sea, thinking this might perhaps be my last chance to swim by choice rather than, say, by the unfortunate sinking of some cockle shell craft in the Azores or wherever we might end up. The water was warm and welcoming, and I had a very enjoyable time until I returned to the shore to find my wallet no longer inside my shoes. Damn it. I eyed the beach for likely suspects, and then noticed a young girl moving rather shiftily from parasol to parasol. I chased after her, and when I was close enough, I pounced, knocking her rather painfully down onto the pebbles. I, recover I recovered far more than I had lost from what flew from her pockets, but she fought like a demon and got away. Family of holidaymakers gave me a look of horror for hurrying their small children in the other direction. I brushed myself down and tried to recover some dignity. A difficult task when one has sand in all sorts of undignified places. I found a sailor to talk to and ask for advice about how we should proceed. He shrugged. There's cars to Venice and the boat to Rome. Depends where you want to go, of course. We're going around the world. I'm going to tell this to everybody. He shrugged. Well, then, you'd better go to Rome. There's airships there. I thanked him and moved along. I approached one of the glitzy casinos at 6.30 in the morning, thinking I could perhaps earn a little money, but it seemed that Nice had gone up a long way in the world and I was refused admission. Gentlemen and ladies only, the doorman said. No one of the lower classes. I had no time for his high standards, so I went elsewhere. My feet were tired. I murmured my goodbyes to the sea, and I knew to France and returned to my master. Your funds have gone up somewhat. Wait, they have? Oh, after being robbed, I guess they went up. Alright, we'll go to Rome. We'll stick on the Mediterranean here. When is the when is the ship to Rome here? The Blue Line ferry departs for Rome tomorrow. Oh, we have to negotiate. Only 97 pounds. Oh, our health doesn't like this, but that's okay. Most generous, wow. At 4 p.m. today. All right, we have time then to to explore for four hours. I took a few hours to explore, investigating the various options for how we might continue our journey. Um, did you find anything? 
Not really. Oh, it's... Wait, I thought we already negotiated this. Boom, let's go. Blue Line Ferry to Rome. We only still only have the one suitcase. And mild seas, so we're gonna go down to 89. That's okay. We'll survive. The Blue Line Ferry. We boarded the Blue Line Ferry, named after the successful train line through France, and found a place on its crowded stern to wave at the port as we departed. Why do people stand at the back of a boat when it's departing, and not the front? I asked my companion, a young woman named Estelle, whom I had bumped into while hauling our case up the ramp. She smiled sweetly. I think, she answered in her gentle, slightly lisping tone, it is because of what happens should you fall off. Uh, you're most likely right, I answered, though I prefer the outward-looking view. You are an explorer, she replied. Indeed so, I replied, or at least I am as of four days ago. Then a roll of the sea made me stumble. We would be aboard for just one night, and I hope I would find my balance, especially when in such fine-looking company. Let's converse. Greetings, Mademoiselle... Madame... Mademoiselle Estelle. I don't know, I was tripping up with the LL thing here. Well, hello again, Monsieur. I'm sure you know all about Rome. Oh, really, Monsieur? How about Rome to Tunis? Yeah, let's go south. Is it possible to go from Rome to Tunis? That seems quite impossible to me. Now, anyway, perhaps a turn around deck? Certainly. Are we dancing? Oh, no, we're just walking. Ah, the warm wind is so wonderful. Now, what do you know about Rome? I cannot talk about that one, sir. Why? How about Rome to Khartoum? Here's something I do know. There is growing resentment of Ottoman rule in Khartoum. Oh, okay. How about Rome to Alexandria? Monsieur, really? You can buy handheld mirrors in Alexandria. Extremely valuable in Suez. Okay, thanks for the irrelevant information. Plus, Alexandria and Suez, isn't that like next to each other? Both in Egypt? Mademoiselle Estelle met me in the restaurant, taking the seat opposite. I have worked it out, she announced cheerfully. What have you worked out, I asked. Who you are, I know your secret. I was taken aback. Perhaps she had seen me during my days in the circus as a youth. What? <laughs> but surely not. At the time, I had been much younger and had often worn excessive quantities of grease paint. She pulled out a copy of the Times. Here, she cried, folding it and lifting, lifting to my attention. It was the headline I had already seen, the story concerning my master and I. I shook my head, knowing my master would wish to maintain his anonymity. I have not heard of this story, but she would not be swayed. Oh, of course you would say that. Giddy with her discovery, she punched me on the arm. What an exciting adventure! Travel is most thrilling, I agreed. Especially now, for me, she replied. Fancy my meeting Phileas Fogg himself. <laughs> Whoops, I paused. You're more dashing than the story made out, she continued excitedly. Wait until I tell my mother. Mmm. Yeah, well, I'll let it pass. It was the gentlemanly thing to do, sure. And ironically, the thing I would have done had I indeed been Monsieur Fogg himself. Well, she said with a proud sigh, I'm sure you're in a hurry, so I won't keep you. I have nowhere to be, I told her, and with gleaming eyes, she folded her hands and moved to sit beside me, saying nothing more. Enjoying, I fear, the simple experience of being starstruck. Okay, so we're kind of lying there. I want to go there. I want to go to Tunis. We arrived into Rome the next day, and I began to unload our case when the captain stopped me. New regulations, he insisted, ordered by the new Italian regime. What regulations? You're traveling from England? Indeed so. Yeah, I'll say that. The captain nodded. And you are required to sign this this disclosure of artificer's materials. He produced a long roll of paper which I began to look over when young Mademoiselle Estelle appeared. Monsieur Fogg, she cried. Uh-oh. I pretended not to have noticed. My master turned his head. Estelle raged us, cheeks flushing. I saw you were leaving, Monsieur Fogg, and without saying farewell. I stayed buried in the customs form. As my master remarked, farewell, Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle Estelle took an uncertain step back, glancing between us. My master's sharp, aquiline profile, my own rounded, Gallic features. I nodded my head. I'm not, I'm not admitting it. 
She thought for a moment more, then grinned. Oh, I understand, she said. Very good. I did not ask. She chuckled to herself, stretched up to peck me on the cheek, and then hurried away in some excitement. Monsieur Faw glanced at me, and I smiled. Youth, I declared. He nodded a touch. Very good, he remarks. <laughs> oh, we got out of that one. I don't know what she was thinking, but I'll take it. Yes, we are stuck in Rome, so we'll have to explore. It's still the morning. Let's see what's going on in the market here. We can probably buy... Let's see, Helsinki? No, we're not going anywhere there. Or Budapest. We're not going that way either, so I'm, we're going to stick to this as our uh, one bag. Let's explore. Okay, so we got Rome to Venice, Venice, Dobrovnik. Oh, still up in Europe, though. I was tossing a coin into the waters of the Trevi Fountain when the Bersaglieri... Sagliari marched into the square with their distinctive fast jog and began rounding everyone up. Their uniforms struck me idiotic. White trousers, spats, and a wide-brimmed cap decorated with a fall of gleaming black caparque feathers. <laughs> In my contemplation, I lost any chance to slip away. No matter, there were too many of them to avoid. A lanky man with only the sparse, sparse beginnings of a mustache gestured at me with his rifle. No. In fact, his entire arm was a rifle, attached to his shoulder with iron bands inlaid with elaborate symbols. I looked at his other hand, which was flesh and blood but fitted with a bladed gauntlet of Murano glass and copper. Whoa. The other Bassiglieri soldiers sported similar modifications to their bodies. They were half human, half automaton. Omsi Shama? That's my best uh, Italian I can do here. The blue-eyed soldier barked. I opened my mouth to reply when someone jostled me from behind, and I turned to see a figure in gray reaching into their pocket, then tossing out a grenade. What? Chaos erupted. People began to scream and scatter in all directions. One of the Bersaglieri <laughs> fired his rifle wildly at one of the tritons gracing the fountain. Only I saw the man in gray flee down an alley. I chased after him instinctively. A rather foolish choice, in hindsight. He made a sharp turn and I... Launched myself at his feet with a rather embarrassing grunt. I felt my age as I brought him down and had to spend a good few moments catching my breath. I heard the thunder of the exploding grenade far behind me as the man in gray tried to find his feet. And then we both collapsed to the ground. Who in the hell are you? I demanded, before sighing. In my discombobulation, I had switched into French. To my surprise, he responded in kind. I am Alexandre Dubois. I am a Zouave, sworn to the Pope, he announced haughtily. You and your Scula dogs will not break me. Scula? I repeated, baffled. The Artificers Guild of Venice, the enemies of the Pope, the power behind the Italian throne. He capitalized his words as he spoke them. A talent I had never perfected. Are you some kind of tourist? Yes, actually, I shrugged. What of it? You look perplexed. Then why did you chase me? What business is this of yours? I stood taller to better emphasize his vulnerable position. I am the one asking the questions. There's only one question that matters. Will you turn me in, or will you come with me as a friend? I followed him. Back to an impressive mansion, a stone's throw from the Pont Sestio. It was the headquarters of the Zouave Rebellion. What was also, as Alexandre somewhat sheepishly explained, his maman's townhouse. He poured me a brandy and raised his glass. To the Pope, he toasted. Yen, sir, I agreed, and down my drink. He set his glass down with a full, or oh, sorry, with a dull thunk. Now, my friend, you must have questions. Soldiers, they were human? Quite human, though parts of them are now machines. I had seen rifles in the place of arms, but that, it seemed, was just the start of it. It seemed the artificers in Italy had turned to a dark and terrible purpose. But what is their aim? Only to see what they can achieve, I think, he sighed. But what of you, Passepartout? What brings you here? We are going around the world, I declared. Well, he exclaimed, an adventurer, then. You will most likely need all the help you can get. 
Know that the artificers outside of Italy are not all bad, and in fact, may well help you. There is a lady in the Bucharest outpost, a friend. She is a cold sort, but generous underneath. I thanked him politely for the advice, but I could not see how to use it. We spoke of Rome, and guilds, and many other things till the hour grew late, and I took my leave. As I walked back to Monsieur Fogg, I could not help but see more signs of the schoola's influence. In Rome, cobblers strapped to gleaming exoskeletons, glass blowers with ceramic hands, porcelain-faced automata fetching water and stoking fires and even soliciting passing trade alongside working girls in scandalously low-cut dresses. Perhaps Rome is the future? I confess I do not know. Your character is now zestful. Alright, it's in the afternoon. We have no route down to down to Africa, which is kind of aggravating. So we're gonna keep going down this way. Look at Alexandria, Cairo, and Suez. We'll go to Athens. Arrives Monday, it's only Saturday. We can probably Okay, we'll do this. We'll do this. So let's stay the night. We're wasting a lot of time here early, but honestly, I don't even care if we make it around the world. I just want to see other routes. That's kind of what's happening here. So we're already on day six, and we're only in Italy. With what remained of the day, I attended to Monsieur Fogg, providing him with clipped mustaches, and we're back to 100. All right, so we've strengthened our relationship with Fogg slightly. Let's depart. Let's go to Athens. Oh yeah, we're taking a... What is this? A, a balloon or something. The Icarus. We boarded a commercial passenger airship in one of Rome's many docks. The stowing of luggage was handled by lines of figures with hooks and extendable poles fitted to their arms. I watched with an acrobat's interest. As they flung cases to one another, swung in and out of the cargo hold, moving about like monkeys. They were cheerful types, full of raucous humor and efficient, for we were all within the cabin of the craft within a few hours, and the ship itself was tugging at its docking ropes after an hour or so more. Let's see what's going on in the old newspaper. Terrorist outrage shakes Rome. Zouave blamed. Yeah, we were there. We almost got knocked out by a grenade. The trip was long and somewhat slow. I find the waiting involved in traveling interminable. I would rather there was more rushing headlong into adventure and a little less planning and preparation. After all, I find, no plan survives longer than the day on which it is made. The airship crossed Italy, and we were approached by one of the cabin staff, a middle-aged lady whose serving tray was jointed to her left hip. Coffee? She asked. Or would you prefer a press? I asked for a coffee. And to my horror, she unscrewed the top of her left thumb and poured thick hot coffee into a mug directly. I was open mouth. She smiled at me. Milk? No, black, thank you. I don't, I don't even want to know where that's coming from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I answered quickly, dreading to think where the milk might be served from. <laughs> oh my god. She handed over the cup and I sipped it. It was, I confess, rather good. The character is now well healed. We were... On the same line of thought there, same wavelength. Ugh, converse. The Aegean below sparkled like a diamond-covered cloth. Even from this great height, we could see the ferry boats plying their trade back and forth across the water. Will airships remove the need for sea travel? I mused to the man next to me, a short Greek fellow with thick spectacles, who tutted with concern. I hope not, he answered, since boats are my livelihood. Putting out his hand, he introduced himself as Dimitri Sophos owner of the Shipping Freight company that ran goods between Greece and North Africa. Yes! I inquired about departures, and he was happy to provide me with a pamphlet outlining the routes and timings. The one, the one of most interest was a sailing to Cairo, which was leaving tomorrow. I took it to my master directly, and he nodded with deep satisfaction. Yes, that would certainly be a possibility, he declared, then reclined back, happy to sleep until we docked. All right. Athens to Cairo, which means we're going down the Nile. Or we can go over to Turkey. 
Antalya, to Beirut, to Alexandria. We're gonna go to Cairo. Oh, the evening jacket can earn us well here. I guess we don't need to keep it forever. Yeah, we've got these now. So... Yeah, we'll grab... We're gonna buy some things here. Bust of Apollo. Saritsin. I have no idea where that is. It sounds... European. Ate some figs. We'll grab some food. The evening jacket is worth 490 here. Let's get rid of it. And... Sure, why not? Syntagma Square. Cool. Close that. We don't need to go to the bank. When when do, when does this go to Cairo? Tomorrow at 8 a.m. Okay, that's fine. We have time to explore and spend the rest of our day here. We've gone a week and it's only been to Greece. Holy moly! Meteora Valley. That's a, so a lot of ways to go to Athens. The master was not, as a rule particularly interested in the fabulous locales and exotic cities we journeyed through. Athens was the exception that proved the rule. His sudden interest was not limited to the city. He fixed me with a look. Do you speak Greek? I had spent a glorious summer with a Greek contortionist who could do the most elegant arabesque penche. Not really, I hedged. I was not entirely certain Monsieur Fogg would approve of my rather specialized vocabulary or my agile methods of language acquisition. Despite my master's grasp of ancient Greek, the demotic variants more commonly spoken on the streets eluded him. We were reduced to asking for directions through a combination of mime, <laughs> moit, apposite quotations from Homer, my master, and half remembered flattery, moi encore, and me again. Picked our way through the labyrinthine streets of the Placa and up the Acropolis. I gazed at the Parthenon, column, Parthenon's columns. It was a magnificent sight, even in ruins. I could only imagine how it must have looked 2,000 years ago, the jewel and the crown of the Athe Athenian Empire. It is exquisite, I breathed, interrupting Monsieur Fogg's silent reverie without quite meaning to. Alas, a quiet, companionable, Moment did not return. Oh. We're still zestful, though. Okay, we're not going to drop the cases. We have to stay here. We're going to leave at 8 a.m. Next morning on day 8 already. As night fell, I went out to explore a little. Why not? And found a somewhat frenetic Slavic clerk who had lost a monocle, which I helped to recover, and who then told me that you could buy handheld mirrors in Cairo, extremely valuable in Tehran. If we were going to go up that way, but we're not, we're heading south. I paid a pound for the information? Sure. And he nodded and then moved away. Okay, we went down by one pound. That's it. I thought maybe we can get some more out of him. Apparently not. Alright, it's the next morning. Let's go to Cairo. Sophos Company Ferry. Oh, sweltering, sweltering heat and mild seas. That's good. We found our way to Sophos' ferry terminal in good time, and waved a greeting to the owner, who was visiting to inspect his fleet. Pass part two, he cried cheerfully. You will join with me and drink some Retzina? Monsieur Fogg lifted an eyebrow but said nothing. That would be most enjoyable. Yeah, we're going, I told him. Never one to refuse a toast. My master shook his head just the tiniest fraction before spying a local cafe and placing himself down outside it. I would not normally abandon my master, but there was something in Sophos's manner that hinted at more than just a desire for society. My instincts were quite correct. He leant, he leant forward. Listen, Passepartout. I could use a man like you. Discreet. Loyal. I nodded, recognizing the description of myself. <laughs> One of the men who works for me in Antalya is a man named Fontaine. He's meant to manage the import and export of black olives, but I do not think that is all he is importing. What can I do to help? I asked, intrigued. I need an outsider, a stranger, someone who cannot be connected to me, with a keen eye and an honest streak. And then I meet you, young Passepartout. Tell me, will you help me? We are going to Cairo, not Antalya. He waved that away. If that is your only concern, that is easily rearranged. Well, 
My master needs me, I replied. I cannot go taking on other jobs. I see, he answered, nodding slowly. He pulled a long leather wallet from his pocket and lay on the table. Tell me, Passport 2, are you the sort of man to be motivated by money? Never! And what is it you want? He asked, puzzled. We are going around the world, I told him. We need transport, connections, speed. Very well then, he agreed. From Antalya, take the boat to Beirut. I will meet you there with a private airship to carry you as far as Manama. From there is a fast boat to Bombay. I shook my head. I'm afraid I cannot. My master and I are engaged on a desperate venture and nothing must get in our way. Sophos looked long and serious. Very well then, he replied. You may still travel aboard my boat, and at least in Cairo, there will be no danger of you sharing my concerns aloud with Monsieur Fontaine. I finished my wine and moved quickly, gratefully away. His manner had been cloying and strange. We clambered aboard Sophos' ferry, finding some space between barrels of olives and large packing crates that smelled of fish. Soon the rope slipped from its ring and we were away. Alright, we're courageous and strengthened slightly. Yeah, I don't want to go up through the Middle East because that's going to get us stuck in the Northern Hemisphere. I really want to go down south, as far south as we can. Because Manama, where are we here? Oh, that's in uh, Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or something. So it's Bombay, that's fine, but we're not going to go. We want to go south, south, south. Let's see what's in the news. Fog Valley, Dapper. Full report. Really? In the Times? Thank you. Thank you. We were away. Next stop, Cairo. On the coast of Africa. Sort of. Sort of on the coast. A few hours later, the sun was lowering. The sailors were stretched out on the deck, enjoying a moment of calm. An hour or so later, we were swarming the rigging and the masts. Or they were, not we were. And bringing us slowly into the bustling port of Alexandria. As we came ashore... I gasped at the sight of the towering lighthouse that blazed a beacon of incredible golden light across the water. I had never seen such a structure. Clearly, something was afoot in this town. The sailors gestured for us to follow. From the port, it was a short carriage ride to Cairo. Let's go. And we arrived in good time. Perfect. Bust of Apollo could earn us well here. It could. Do I have that? Well, we're too late. Let's take the hotel in Cairo. Cairo is attempting to modernize, following the Parisian model. The result is a mishmash of tree-lined streets and maze-like soups. Of course, the people do not care, and most certainly do not dress like Parisians. I was browsing a, the souk when I felt a hand dip into my pocket. Oh, come again. I turned around fast, but the little girl whose hand was in my pocket was clearly well practiced and slid between my knees to run away. I was 30 pounds poorer. Robbed twice already? I'm in roaring help, but we must make haste. Yeah, we need to figure out a way to go. Alright, we got Suez, we've got Luxor, As Aswan, and Ail. I spent a few hours in exploration learning ways in which we might travel onwards. Let's hit the market. Bust of Apollo here. This is not. Wait. But we could get it for much more in uh, Tsaritsin. Hand mirrors. Valvo. Aiden, Suez, and Tehran. Beaten Golden Ring. Whoa. That's worth a lot of money. Um, no, we're good. Let's see, where can we go? Gotta zoom out here. Aswan. Nile Express departs for Aswan tomorrow at 8 a.m. I think that's what we're gonna do, and I think I'm gonna call it quits here. It's gonna be 13, 13 days per episode, but we're already reaching 40 minutes, so... We are in Cairo. We're gonna go... We're just gonna keep heading south, all the way to South Africa, and then try to see what options there are to cross. All right. So thank you for watching, and, you know, the next season, different story, this is fun. 80 days, alright, I'll see you next time, take care, and goodbye.